Okay, so final video here in our micro foundations. This completes our first week of video, so congratulations upon completion here. What we are looking at in this video is our circular flow model. Well, the basic circular flow model. We will expand upon this. We will build it out, of course, as we move through this course. This is just an introduction to this simple version. And then on top of this, we'll be taking a look at the labor markets as well as financial markets. So keep in mind what we had previously looked at were goods markets. Goods markets being, hey, the purchase of goods or services and the looks of that, supply and demand, giving us equilibrium price and quantity exchanged. There's not really a fundamental difference between our goods market, our labor market, and our financial markets. The big difference is just, hey, what do we price it in? Wage for labor, interest rate for financial markets, and then just a slightly different way in which we can think of each one. But ultimately, they are near identical. And so as such, we will breeze through this video. There's not too much to actually add to our previous one. So let's jump on and let's carry forward. So here we have what we looked at in the previous video, which was in our goods market, hey, our market for trucks. We had our determinants of supply. We had our determinants of demand. Keeping in mind, these determinants were things that caused that supply curve or that demand curve to shift to the left or to shift to the right. And where the supply equals the demand, we have an allocatively efficient level of output, the amount of stuff we buy and sell, and the corresponding price of the goods or services. Okay. So the way we want to think about this circular flow diagram is let's think about it in terms of households, you and I, and firms, that is our businesses, our producers of goods and services. And what we're going to have is we're going to have a market for goods and services, price and quantity. And over here, we're going to have a, another market and this is going to be our market for labor. So this will be our labor market. Ah, let's do that a bit better. This is our market for labor. And over here, this is our market for goods and services. Okay. So what's happening? Well, our firm is supplying right quantity supplied so the flow of quantity they are supplying goods and services to this market so there is our supply right the amount that is coming from these firms into this marketplace you and i well the household we are demanding these goods and services so we of course have our quantity demand and our demand curve going down. Where these two intersect, of course, we get an equilibrium quantity exchanged and an equilibrium price. What's happening though? While quantity is flowing from the firm to the household, we have money flowing from the household to the firm. So one half of our circular flow diagram. Okay. But let's keep in mind, this firm cannot just will goods and services into existence. In order for this producer to actually produce goods and services, they need our inputs into our production process. And these inputs are twofold. That is, we can say that the quantity produced is some function of our technology, but also of labor and capital. Hey, labor... This is predominantly what you and I end up supplying to the labor market. That is our household supplies labor. Oh, wrong direction. Our household supplies labor to our labor market. And that labor is then purchased by the firm. That is, they have some amount of labor that they want to demand, their quantity demanded. So the firm in this case is demanding labor and the household is the supplier. Very similarly, what's happening then 
is our money is flowing this way. And we see all together how our money flows around from the household, buying goods and services to the firm. The firm then uses all that money received to pay its people, owners, etc. That there then gets paid out in wages back to the household, which then buys more goods and services, and we cycle around. Okay. So that's our simple way to think about it. We'll hit our goods and services market versus our labor market. What we also have, of course, our other factor of production is our capital, our machinery, our equipment, all of that that goes into our production process. All of this needs to be financed. All of this needs to be purchased, large sums of money typically. And so what we want to take a look at in this case here is our capital markets or our financial markets. And that is when we think about our household, all of this money going to goods and services, well, this is our consumption, right? This is our consumption. This is how everything that we go, all of this here going from our labor market into the household, this is our income, all the money we end up making. Well, keep in mind for most of us, income does not equal consumption. Sometimes we end up consuming more than we make. But ideally, we end up squirreling away some of our income for a rainy day. That is what we end up doing is we end up saving our money. And that is by saving our money, what we are doing is we are supplying money to another market that we can throw in here, which is our financial markets. And that is we are supplying money to our financial markets. We're saying, hey, I don't need this money right now. I want to save it. And so here we go. I'm throwing this money in. Keep in mind. There we go. This is money in this case going into our financial markets. And on the flip side, our producer our producer needs that money in order to purchase new capital, in order to invest. And so by purchasing new capital to increase their productive capabilities, they then have a demand for loanable funds. They demand money from this market. And so we can add in this final one being our financial markets. So we see three markets working in conjunction and all, of course, flowing around the flow of money. Everything that the firm earns here gets paid out in wages, income back here. Consumption back to the firm around, around, around. Of course, this is highly, highly simplified, right? Of course, sometimes, sometimes these households they're not savers. They're not supplying money to the financial markets. Sometimes they're borrowers. Sometimes they'd be demanding money from financial markets. Sometimes these firms, they have excess money. Sometimes not all the money goes off to labor. Sometimes some of this money goes back to pay interest, to pay dividends to these savers. So of course, the money does, of course, flow this way as well through our financial markets. So three different markets. We've taken a look at our goods and services so far. Let's take a look at our financial and our labor markets next for a brief overview. And like I said, there's not actually a ton of extra for us to go through in this case. So let's go jump over and let's take a look at labor markets to start off. So in our labor market, we can view it as such. We can have the price of labor, which is what we would refer to as our wage, so W for wage, versus our quantity. And we can think of this as either full-time equivalent, so quantity of FTE. We can think of this as hours. Uh, we can think of this in many, many different ways, but irrespective, the same kind of, the same kind of modeling process holds. We have our demand for labor. Let's keep in mind who's demanding labor. This is the firm, this is the producer that is demanding your labor. So this is where our labor markets are often 
backwards from where we're thinking about them is that we're used to being the demander. We are used to demanding goods and services. We're used to thinking about the demand and thinking about us. But no, 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 for the producer, they are the demander of your labor. You, you are the supplier of your labor. You supply your labor to this market. And right, like in every other case, the more hours you supply, well, the more and more stuff you're giving up, the more free time, the more leisure, the more time with family that you're giving up. This carries increasing opportunity costs. So hey, as you increase the quantity of hours supplied, you have an increasing cost of doing so. So thus you're increasing supply curve. Being like, hey, yeah, if you want me to supply this many hours, you better compensate me with a high wage. Okay, just like in any other case, supply, demand, what we obtain is our equilibrium price and quantity in the market. So there we go, we would get our equilibrium wage and our equilibrium quantity exchanged. If, if let's use a different color here, if wages were held low, if wages were held too low, well then our quantity supplied would be as such, but the demand from firms would be as such. We would have excess demand for labor, and the firm, in order to attract talent, in order to be able to get more workers, we'll produce more stuff, you need people to produce stuff, the firm would have to push up the price as they push up the price, offer higher salaries, workers say, yeah, okay, I'll take that higher salary, and we'd make our way up to our equilibrium. Quantity demanded would fall, quantity supplied would rise. Very similar, the opposite would also be true. If we had a really high price of labor, if the price of labor was too high, we'll go, wage high, well, firms, firms are not gonna want to demand very much labor at this high price, so quantity demanded would be low, but you and I, we'd be willing to supply lots of our labor at this high price, we think this is awesome, so we would have lots of excess supply of labor. So all of this, all of this is our excess supply. In our labor market, we actually have a special word for this excess supply of labor. We call this excess supply unemployment. And specifically, we typically refer to this as our cyclical unemployment. That is, yes, we would, we'll get to this, we expect there will always be a level of unemployment, but cyclical unemployment is going to be due to these changes between wage and equilibrium wage. So we'll get to that in a lot more in following videos. Don't worry, don't get too caught up about it. But essentially this excess supply is our unemployment. So our situation that arises there. What do we have for our factors going on here? Just like we had factors of supply and demand in our goods market, we're again gonna have factors for supply and demand in our labor market. So let's talk about, first of all, the demand curve. Just to switch it up, we talked about supply first last time. So for our demand curve, first thing that's gonna influence how many workers we're demanding, how many workers we need, maybe let's clean this up first. Okay, so for this demand curve, the first factor that we're gonna look at is of course what the producer's demand for output is. If they need to produce more stuff, well, if they need to produce more stuff, they're gonna need a higher demand for people in order to produce that extra quantity. So if they need to produce more, they need more people. So more output, more demand for labor. So that's the first thing. Second thing is gonna be the level of education education or training. 
right? In this case here, a well-educated workforce, if you are really educated, you're typically pretty productive. If you're well-trained, you already know what you're doing. All of this is an increase in the demand for you, right? You already have the education. You already have the training. You are attractive to a potential employer. It's an increase in demand for educated and trained individuals. That is now all of a sudden the employer does not have to train you themselves. So, hey, increased demand for those situations there. We're also going to have technology. Technology can work either as an increase in demand or as a decrease in demand. Sometimes technology is that move towards roboticization, towards autom um, towards automization. That's not a word. Uh, movement towards automating everything, in which case there, hey, you need less workers, less workers, less demand for labor. So, okay, sometimes it goes in that way. Other technologies, yes, all of a sudden we get more capital that's more efficient, but we need more labor in order to be able to utilize that technology effectively. So, in those cases where you need more labor to utilize that technology, demand will shift to the right. In cases where technology just replaces labor, technology is a substitute for labor, well then demand would shift to the left. Similar to our goods and services market, we're also gonna be looking at the number of firms, the number of companies out there. Of course, if there's more companies in an area all hiring, there's gonna be more demand for labor. If you're in a small town with only a few companies, well, there'd be less demand for labor. So that of course is gonna influence our labor curve as well. What we're going to have is, again, we're going to be taking a look at regulations. If it's really easy to hire labor, if it's just, yeah, I can pick you up easily. Don't need to worry too much about health and safety. Don't need to worry about hours or payroll or, you know, all these little nitty gritty things that employers don't like. I'd have a high demand for workers. If all of a sudden you make me worry about health, safety, work safe, am I paying you proper overtime or not? Oh my goodness, all these regulations, that there is just a friction and that there is going to decrease my demand for labor as an employer. Right, I say that all tongue in cheek, hopefully you caught that. These regulations typically are seen as a very good thing for the people, for the laborers, but from the business side, from the producer side, they are a hassle, they are a cost, and thus these regulations decrease the demand for workers. Final factor. Price or availability. Ah, I can't write. Let's try that again. Price or availability of other factors. That is, hey, if capital is really cheap, and to a degree I can substitute between capital and labor, that is, hey, I can replace tellers with an automated checkout machine and the price of an automated checkout machine is good and they're available for me to buy well then yeah i'm going to substitute labor for capital so depending on what this works out to be i might be decreasing my demand for labor at the same time on the other hand rise of personal computers has made individual workers vastly more productive Cheap personal computers, widely available, has drastically increased the productivity of people, thus by increasing the demand for workers. So, of course, right, just like with technology, this can go both ways. It can be a situation where it replaces labor, or it can be a situation where it augments labor and thus increases the demand of labor. So, two different situations to consider there. What else do we have? Well, that's it for demand, but let's go take a look at our supply. From the supply side, so again, this is you and I, what we are wanting to go through here. First one we can take a look at is the number of workers. So if you're in a large city with lots and lots and lots of workers, well, that's a lot of supply. So hey, lots of workers, lots of people wanting to work, supply is shifting to the right. 
you're on a smaller area, you don't have as much laborers, smaller pool of people to pull from, well, supply to the left. Second one, second one is required education. That is, what level of education or training do you need for the job? The more difficult it is to obtain that education, the more difficult it is to obtain that training, the fewer people, the fewer workers there are going to be that actually have it, and thus the less the supply. The easier that training, the easier that education is to obtain, the more people will obtain it, and the more the supply, right? So think about that. Supply shifts to the right because of easy education. Wages drop. Very tough education. Supply shifts to the left. Wages go up, right? This here is a big reason to explain why doctor's wages are higher than nurses' wages. It's nothing about a value statement that, hey, doctors are valued more than nurses or doctors do more work than nurses. It is the difficulty of the education. There's a lot fewer doctors because of the higher difficulty for the education. As a result, they command a higher wage because of the less supply. Same kind of idea. PhD in mathematics, pretty difficult. So not very much going on there. Very small supply. Mind you, at the same time, there might not be a ton of demand for that. So, right, you can't always just take them on their own. What we also have is we also have government policies. So government policies, these can influence the amount that you want to supply. And this can be situations like licenses. Like, okay, you have to jump through these hoops in order to be able to actually supply your labor, right? Oh, I can't actually be a teacher unless I get a teaching certificate. I can't sell insurance unless I get an insurance license. I can't sell financial products unless I have a license to do so. So all of these policies that, hey, ensure that I actually have the right qualifications, they actually restrict the supply of workers in this area, thus thereby pushing up the wages. Some of this can be problematic too, right? What if these licenses are provincial based? I have a license in this province and I wanna to move to another province. Well, now all of a sudden, my license isn't transferable, I have to jump through all these hoops in order to supply my labor in the other province. I don't have this easy mobility of labor. So problems there. Some of these other, other policies can be welfare, unemployment insurance, maternity benefits, sick benefits, right? All of these extra benefits give an incentive for people not to work, right? Hey, I can collect so much from being unemployed. Well, hey, if I collect so much from being unemployed, maybe I'm okay with that. Maybe I don't want to work. Maybe I'm okay just earning this bare minimum. A lot of people might not be, but for some people, they will. So these kind of welfare policies that get put into place, they all restrict or decrease the supply of workers. So in that case there, decreasing the supply of workers, pushing up the wage. Okay. So that's our idea there as to our labor markets. Again, just like we went through with our goods and services markets, you could work through, hey, some shock happens. What does that do to the supply curve? What does that do to the demand curve? Which one is impacted? What happens to the wage? What happens to the quantity? Again, I'm not going to go through this here for any examples in the video, but end of chapter questions in the textbook. There's some great questions in the self-check. Take a look at those, see if you can work through them. Same kind of extent as to what I'm expecting from the micro foundations part, say on a future quiz or midterm. Let's go jump and take a look at financial markets then. So financial markets, in this case here, let's go jump over. In financial markets, what we have is we have here the interest rate, as our price, right? So, hey, the interest rate, that is the cost, that is the price of money. On the horizontal, we have the quantity of money, which is being exchanged. What we would have is we would have downward sloping. We would have a demand for money. So this is, hey, I need money because I want to buy a car and I don't have enough. So, hey, demand for money is a borrowing of money. 
right? As a demander, I'm borrowing money from somebody else. As a supplier in this market, well, a supplier is an individual or a firm that has more income than they have expenditure, and thus they are supplying their extra money into this market in order to, well, hopefully earn an interest rate, a return. So in this sense here, where we have equilibrium, supply of loanable funds, demand of loanable funds, this gives us, of course, our corresponding equilibrium interest rate and equilibrium quantity exchanged. How much dollars are floating around in buying and selling, in borrowing and saving, and on the other side, what we have for our rate of return, what we have for our real interest rate. And don't get too caught up on that with what I mean by real interest rate. That will be all cleared up in coming chapters. Just keep in mind, this is our interest rate. When you go get a car loan and they say, hey, 4.49%. Well, where does that 4.49 come from? Well, okay, there's a lot there to do with risk and a whole bunch of underwriting and stuff like that. But in a very simplistic way, what is the demand? How many people are looking for loans? versus how many people are offering the money out to be lent out. That together is the primary, one of the biggest factors influencing that interest rate. So that there being our financial markets. We're actually not gonna get much farther into it than that, right? We're not gonna get into the factors of supply. We're not gonna get into the factors of demand. We will eventually, but not quite yet. We wanna build up a bit more before we get there. Okay, let's talk about one final thing. Let's go back to our labor markets and let's take a look at the impacts of something like minimum wage. Price, quantity. Okay, there's my demand curve. Upward sloping. There's my supply curve. And this is, of course, this is my labor market, so let's not do price, so let's be clear. This is wage. So labor market. Let's suppose that supply and demand, just how many people are willing to work versus how many people that the firms are demanding, gives us some quantity exchanged and gives us a wage of, let's say, $8 an hour. Okay, let's suppose we're not happy with that. Let's say, you know what, we have this right, we believe that we should have a sustainable living wage, a wage that you can actually live off of, and as a result, we petition the government to impose a minimum wage. Well, what a minimum wage is, is a binding well, in this scenario, it would be a binding price floor. It's not necessarily always binding, but in our scenario, let's suppose it's a binding price floor. And all that binding means is that it actually has an impact on this market. And so let's suppose that what happens is that we want to impose this minimum wage, this binding minimum wage of $15 an hour. We believe that, hey, this is going to be a fair wage. Well, okay, what happens? What happens is we do that. Well, essentially, we go and we say, boom, that is my price floor, meaning this is legally the minimum price. That is, it is illegal to pay somebody less than $15 an hour. Right? It, is, it is illegal to pay less than $15 an hour if you're a demander. It is also illegal to sell your labor for less than $15 an hour if you're a supplier of labor. Keep in mind, there's lots of people on the supply curve that would be okay selling for less than $15 an hour. What ends up happening with this case? What ends up happening? Well, we get price floor to our demand curve we get our quantity demanded underneath the price floor. What else do we have? Well, price floor to our quantity supplied, we get our quantity supplied. That is, we have all of this 
excess supply of labor. Again, in the labor market, we call that unemployment. And all of this excess supply of labor, well, this is now just unemployed people. So the question is, by putting in this minimum wage, are we actually better off? Right? Keep in mind, we used to be at quantity exchanged and a price of $8. Put a price floor into effect. What's our quantity exchange now? Well, keep in mind what happens. Quantity exchanged is the lesser of the two in a disequilibrium situation. So our quantity exchanged falls to be the quantity demanded. So we used to have all of these people working. We now drop all the way down to this number of people working. Price, wage, yeah, yeah, wage goes up. Wage goes up for the people who maintain their jobs. This remainder here, who were working at the initial equilibrium, these guys here are since laid off. They now become unemployed. Clearly, that group there is worse off due to this minimum wage law. So the impacts of minimum wage, the way we can model the impacts of minimum wage on our labor markets. Okay. Hopefully that set a little bit of people uneasy, right? You're like, but no, isn't aren't minimum wage, like, isn't this to ensure social fairness and all this kind of stuff? Clearly it can't all be bad. Well, okay. Typically in an intro course, we would stop that. We would stop right there and say, look, minimum wage, bad, increases unemployment. All of these yellow people were willing to work. They're now unemployed because we put in minimum wage. Society's worse off. Boo, minimum wage bad. Okay, that's not actually always the case. And that is so far with our supply and demand diagrams, we have actually had an as implicit assumption that we have not discussed. And this implicit assumption is we have lots of buyers. We have lots of sellers, right? So lots of buyers, this is the demander. Lots of sellers, this is the supplier. And what is inferred with this, having lots and lots of buyers, having lots of lots of sellers, is that all of these guys here are what we would call price takers. They have no power in the market. They have no ability to push down wages or to push up wages, right? So in this case here, if we're talking about the labor market, the demander, that firm, that company that's going to hire you, they cannot hold your wage low. Because if they try to hold your wage low, they say, yeah, no, we're only going to, I, I know, I know given your expertise, People would give you 50 grand, but hey, we're going to hold your wage at 40. You'd say, sorry, I'm walking away. I'm going to go to one of these other employers because there's lots of people wanting to buy my labor. Similarly, the sellers, the sellers, you and I, we don't get to negotiate up our wages because if we tried, if we said, yeah, yeah, no, 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 I want an extra 10 grand, please. Well, our employer would laugh at us and say, well, there's actually lots of other people willing to work for the amount we were paying you. So no, we're not paying you more, right? In both cases, the supplier and the demander are strictly price takers. They just have to take the price that the market dictates. Okay, hopefully you realize that in the world around us, this is not always true. In micro, we take a look at a lot of cases of market failure where this falls apart and where either the buyer or the seller gets to influence that market price. We don't get into that in macro. In macro, one of our implicit assumptions that we carry forward in all of our modeling is actually the assumption of efficient markets. That is the assumption that we have lots of buyers and lots of sellers and that markets clear efficiently. Hopefully, right, you're realizing, ah, I don't know if that's always true. Yeah, it might not be, right? It might not be. And in which case, there might be some problems in our corresponding models going forward. How big those are? Well, that's room for debate. Arguably, it's 
they're there, they're errors, they're problems, but they're not large enough to invalidate our models. So keep that part in mind, but keep in mind as well, when we're doing these models here, when we're dealing with supply and demand, we have our implicit assumption that there's lots of suppliers, lots of demanders, such that no one can influence that equilibrium price, right? Walmart doesn't exist. Amazon doesn't exist. Amazon cannot hold down the wages of its employees because if they did, well, their employees would just go to the next firm, right? In this case here, in reality, we know that's not true. But in this case, for an introductory course, we have to wave our hands. We have to presume that we have these efficient markets, that everybody is a price taker. And yes, if we have these efficient markets, minimum wage is bad. If we have these large firms, however, well, minimum wage pushing in these kind of things can actually increase employment, not unemployment, but employment. So we can get more people working at a higher wage, altogether increasing social welfare. So in reality, it's always a bit messier. Again, if you're interested in that, well, sorry, you're going to have to get through this course and into some higher level economics to really start to get into the really interesting stuff. Okay, so that does us for our last little bit, taking a look at our circular flow diagram, taking a look at labor markets, including that little bit with the price floor, and taking a look at our financial markets. If you have any questions with these, really the big thing I wanted to show you was just that circular flow diagram, the fact that in labor markets, you and I are the supplier rather than the demander, and just to get an idea as to all the ways that money flows around between households and firms. If you have any questions on any of this, of course, feel free to reach out to me, either through the D2L Frequently Asked Questions, or shoot me an email. Thanks. Bye.